Hello, beautiful Lightfold Souls. My name is Trisha Barker, and I'm so excited to be here with Kenneth Lett, who's going to talk about pre-birth memories and a near-death experience. Uh, if you haven't checked out the summit that is coming up on June 16th, please check the link below. I have many near-death experiencers who are going to be talking all day on June 16th from 7 in the morning till 7 at night. Uh, so please check that out. We'd love it if you would join us and participate and leave your questions below. Please like and subscribe to this video because I know you'll want to see more interviews like this one. So anyway, let's go ahead and begin. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited about this call. Well, I am too, and, and thank you. I love the invitation. It's, um, it's a chance to connect with people, and, and I'm all for that. Yeah, so. yeah, me too. I mean, these stories offer hope to so many people at different times in their life when they're really struggling with life purpose and what are we going to do next and i i'm really curious about your pre-birth memories could you begin with some of that like you believe that maybe you died in the womb or you know there was some sort of remembering at uh, at birth of the afterlife um yes it I have memories of my birth. Um, I was born in 1955, but those, at first I believe those memories came to me when I went through a life review, uh, when I had a near-death experience in 1963, when I was eight years old. That was my first impression. Now with time, I'm starting to realize that um, I've been talking to other near-death experience people, uh, Facebook has been a great benefit and tool for me. Uh, Near-death experience groups are wonderful. So I've met some really wonderful people who have uh, encouraged me to think, um, meditate, and really focus on what I've been through. Um, I believe I've lived a past life. I believe, um, I can recall, I don't just believe, I know, I can recall uh, meeting with the Council of Elders, I believe is what they're called. I was um, asked very important questions, and apparently it was decided in that meeting that I wasn't quite ready to stay in heaven. So I was sent back. Um, I was taken to a place where um, I was shown a couple, my mother and father. I was shown them on earth. Um, I was told, now do you see? They're very loving people. They will treat you well. We want you to go to them. You will be their child. So I agreed to it. They sent me down, and this might be a little bit hard for people to understand, but I believe when I was in my mother's womb, I was used to her heartbeat. I was used to her sense of love. I knew when she was sleeping, I knew when she was awake. I knew when she was happy, I knew when she was sad. Uh, one night, I remember being uh, shaken and something woke me up because there was a lot of shaking going on. I believe my parents were having sex, but I'm not real sure. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I have a memory of it and I remember being in the womb thinking, my goodness, what is going on here? And then when it was over, I was glad. Um, <laughs> now beyond all that, okay. <laughs> now people to... are going to think and <laughs> think twice about having sex during <laughs> later terms of pregnancy. That's funny. <laughs> well, yeah. I, all I know is I have the memory. That's all I can tell you. Oh, wow. So, uh, so my childhood. Okay. So while um, I was in birth, um, while my mother was giving birth, there was an accident that took place. Uh, it was a very small town. Um, the hospital was actually in a house. <clears throat> My mother was given an overdose of laughing gas. Um, what happened was uh, they had a very old doctor. He had no nurse or attendant. He was just doing it himself. And in those days, 1955, they used a, a laughing gas to help ease the pain of, of birth. And the doctor knew my father was a hunter and was outside the room and he loved to hunt. So the doctor wanted to go talk about hunting with my dad and take a cigarette break. 
he left the laughing gas mask on next to my mother's face. And he told her, whenever you have a lot of pain, turn your head into the mask and breathe. So he walked out, took a cigarette break, a long one with my father. When he came back, my mother was knocked out and the mask was on her face. Wow. So she was overdosed with laughing gas. So what I recall is the natural movements and the pushing of her uterus, pushing me out, had stalled. And I was in agony because I was being squeezed. Then mom's heart started to slow down. Um, I remember deciding, and I don't believe this or not, as a baby, I remember feeling like I need to move. I need to get out of here. So I felt myself back up and I turned into a ball of energy and I started flying around in a place that was full of colors. I met another entity. It turned out to be a girl. I knew it was a girl. Okay, let's just put it that way. I didn't know who it was. I just knew it was a girl. She taught me how to fly and we flew around this place that was full of colors and brilliant, brilliant light. Um, then Another third entity, which I believe I recall it being a, a grown man, came to us and said to me, you must be born, you must go back to your body. The girl or the entity I was flying around with didn't want me to leave, she wanted to keep playing. But I went back to my body. Now, and I, I learned um, when my mother died in 2000 uh, or 2012, she gave me, uh, this bit of information that um, I had not known my entire life. She had a miscarriage before I was born, and it was a girl. Oh, wow. So I suspect, or I believe, that that entity that I met was my sister that had not been born. Makes complete sense. That I'm sure that it is. You wouldn't be alone in that uh, connection. Yeah. Right, right, right. So... But I believe the, the reason why I remember this in such detail is because in 1963, when I was eight, um, I was kept at home from school because of uh, uh, flu-like symptoms. They kept me at home for about a week and a half. And this and is your near-death experience? This is, and you were eight? 1963, when I was wow. eight. So, so you began to remember this when you had this next experience? Correct. Interesting. Um, because, because that in 1963, I had an actual life review of my short life, my eight mm -hmm. years on Earth. I witnessed my own birth during wow. my life review. And from then on, I always felt like there was something missing to the puzzle, like something happened at my birth, but I wasn't sure what it was. So... Um, when my mother was on her deathbed, she told me the whole story about the miscarriage and all the pieces just came together. Wow. And then I knew that's the reason why I witnessed it when I was up in heaven. So that is very interesting to have a life review at only eight years old. What did you learn? Well, first, just lead me through the near-death experience that occurred then. And then I really would like to hear what you learned in a life review at such a young age, because usually children are so innocent and good-hearted, you know, that there wouldn't seem to be that many deep lessons, perhaps, but it'll be interesting to hear what you have to say. Okay, well, um, let me start, first of all, with the sickness. Um, I just had been playing outside after school, and it was time for dinner, and I was called in. A favorite meal that my mother had made was available, and I was hungry, and I started to eat. But all of a sudden, my tummy just did a flip-flop, and I had to vomit quick. And that's how it started. It resembled the flu. It turned out to be my appendix. So um, the doctor was called over the phone. I didn't, they didn't take me to his office. They just described my symptoms to the doctor on the phone. He said it sounded like classic flu. Keep him home. Give him fluids and uh, it'll work itself out. Well, uh, I couldn't drink anything. I couldn't, you know, I ran to the restroom and took care of the vomiting myself. And uh, I never told my parents that uh, it was so severe that I was vomiting yellow bile. It burned terribly. 
and I wasn't drinking any water and they thought I was. So, okay, so let's take it about a week and a half later. I was home alone. My mother was called into her job because uh, she had been staying with me, but she was called into her job because uh, her, her boss was desperate for some help. And so I, I spent a morning by myself, dehydration kicked in, and I woke up on the couch so thirsty I couldn't stand it. I took a, I somehow got to the kitchen, took a drink of water, and passed out. I woke up on the floor, crawled back to the couch, and I felt something move in my stomach. It was like a relief of pressure, and it just sort of snapped or moved. And almost instantly, I felt better. So my mom came home uh, from work and I told her the whole story. And she said, you know, I'm glad you're feeling better, but you're extremely pale. Some, for some reason, she waited another day. Oh no. <laughs> the next morning, she said, you're going to the doctor. Got me in the car. Doctor took one look at me, laid me on the table, poked my stomach and I yelled because it hurt. And he said, this kid's gonna get an immediate operation. And he said, um, go straight to the hospital. I will make all the arrangements. And he did. And so within a half an hour, uh, the nurses had my, my stomach shaved and I was on a gurney and they were pushing me to the emergency room. It was a small town hospital, so they didn't have the, the good anesthesia that they do these days. So they used the ether. Ooh. This stuff is horrible. Oh, wow. Smell was, supposedly it doesn't have a smell, but I remember it, and it was horrible. So after I was strapped down to the table, I was terrified because I was strapped down. So after the ether knocked me out, I suddenly came back to consciousness, only I wasn't in my body. It was like I would, had become a tiny amoeba in a very black, dark place. And I started to grow cell by cell by cell. And I remember consciously making the decision, I want to live. So I kept growing. And as I grew, I became wider and wider and wider. And eventually I could see myself. And I looked like me, only I was gray and wispy. I could see through myself. Oh, so it was like the spiritual version of yourself, or what do you think that that my was? My consciousness, my soul. Yeah. It was almost like I could hear a voice asking me, do you want to live or do you want to die? But I don't remember hearing a specific voice, but I remember a conscious decision, I want to live. So um, I became myself and... And I became conscious that I was in a very black place. Did you want to live for your parents or for no other reason other than just wanting to live? Just to live. Mm -hmm. Just for me. Um, at that point, I didn't really realize I was outside my body. So then I started seeing um, wispy people. And it turns out I believe they were ghosts. Were rising up from below me going up to a place up above and I could tell there was a light up there and they were mostly older people that looked like grandparents to me mm -hmm. and they were smiling and they looked very happy and they were going up and one of them even stopped and said you shouldn't stay here you should go with us oh that's great so, yeah. <laughs> they're excited so, yeah so I tried and then I realized that I was tethered to my body that's when I realized that I was outside my body because there was a, a rope or a string that went from my stomach down to my body and I could see it down in the operating table. So I jump and I would try, I would try everything I could, but the tether kept me there. So the ghost that stopped to, to help me or the spirit that stopped to help me had to go on. There was a sense of urgency to go up to the light. So it, it went on and left me there. Huh. So, what I discovered then was um, I wasn't alone. There's a little, I, I've written about this and there's a little more detail, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave out some of it because it, it doesn't help tell the whole story. Um, 
The next important thing I should tell you, though, is what happened was I realized I wasn't there alone, that I was being watched. Hmm. I wasn't afraid. But then I started seeing eyes in the distance, and they were, like, hiding behind a black barrier. Um, and I knew they were evil because they could read my thoughts, and I could read theirs, and they wanted to hurt me. Then I got scared. And I, w I was a child. I still, I still connected with the fact that I was a child. When they came to me, I started to cry. Um, I told them to leave me alone. They started laughing and teasing. And they could fly when I could not. And they would swoop down and hit me sort of like in a body slam. And I would spin in circles. I couldn't leave because of the tether. And it was pure torture. So I believe uh, the spirits that do not believe in God, do not believe in a higher self, do not believe in the light, um, do not believe in heaven, don't believe in love, they end up trapped in this dark place. That was the impression I got. Interesting. They were like, uh, yeah, they were like bullies on the playground. Interesting. That's what and, they were like. And, you know, and they were trying... Go ahead. The only context I have to that is I did interview Howard Storm, who had a full hellish experience and was dragged down, you know, with these entities. But, but this is interesting because you're a child and somewhat innocent, and yet you're still encountering them and getting a sense of, of what was going on. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. they didn't pull you anywhere, I suppose. They tried. They were going to um, destroy me. They were going to put out my light. I, the, um, the way it felt was they were angry with me because I still glowed with a little bit of light, a little bit of life, where they had none. They were blacker than black. They resented me, and they tried to extinguish me. So at some point, as I was spinning, I repeated words that I'd heard my mother say many, many times, and that was, please, God, make them stop and immediately they stopped. And the reason was because my call was heard. Um, I heard a voice in the distance calling out to me, hello there, hello, where are you? I heard you call, where are you? And it was a very kind and gentle voice. It turned out to be an angel. So he kept calling out and I would respond and eventually he found me. He had to come down a, a distance to come down to find me. He glowed with light and when he showed up those entities that were attacking me took off they couldn't tolerate his light so that's the other thing I've learned is that darkness and the lack of faith they cannot live they cannot exist in the light that is a power that God has that they can't tolerate they have to hide in the depths in the darkness so um, the angel came to me and we had a conversation and he asked me how come I hadn't gone up like all the other uh, spirits. And so I showed him my tether, tether and he even looked down into the operating room and he saw my body there and he, and he understood perfectly. And um, I couldn't see him too well at first and it was a him. I couldn't see him too well at first and I told him so and he said, well, you just have to look at me. Look at me. And he backed up and he said, just look. And the more I looked at him, the more in focus he came and he got brighter and brighter and brighter. And he had so much love in him. I just loved him immediately. And I felt isn't, so comfortable. Isn't that interesting how you have impressions and you know more than is being said or communicated in that afterlife experience? Like you understood what those dark spirits were like without having to say much more. It was just this intuitive knowing. And the same thing with the angels. Like I certainly knew love and healing and light and beauty and peace by just looking at the angels. And it, was it just a recognition? You just looked into, could you describe the angel a little bit more and, and just explain how you knew? Exactly, I can. Um, he had a very long, white, blowing robe, and he sort of hovered and floated. I did not see wings. I believe the wing thing kind of came up. Somebody in the past probably said, 
well, you can't, no human can actually hover, so they must have wings. <laughs> or dart that's... from place to place, and so they must fly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so they must fly. <laughs> it's funny how humans try to put spiritual things in human terms. Yes. But, uh, but he, he floated and hovered around me, and he could move. Um, I also remember he was very handsome. Um, I remember his voice was very calming and gentle. Um, he had a horn, and I believe he might have also had a sword that was over his shoulder, because mm. I remember asking him about them. And he told me, not just yet, but someday, he would be asked to blow the horn and use the sword. If there was a day coming, but not yet. So um, it was under, I, I understood that he was there to help me, but as long as he was there, that the evil spirits wouldn't attack me. So he just simply said, well, it looks like you need to go up like all the others. So how are we going to do that? So I tried to fly and I showed him how I was attached and I couldn't do it. So he said, well, we'll take care of that. And he took his sword and he cut my tether and he put me in a bubble. It was big enough that I could fit in it comfortably. And, um, it was clear so I could see through it. And he said, this bubble will take you up where all the others went and you'll be safe. And he said, I have to go. I have other things I must do. So I have to leave you now. So he did. And my bubble took me up and up and up. And at some point I looked down and I realized that I was in space over the earth going up and I could see the earth spinning, revolving underneath me. And I realized I was in outer space. It's not a flat earth like the flat earthers say, right? <laughs> it most certainly is not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to be goofy. <laughs> uh, flat earthers, I'm sorry, but uh, you're wrong. <laughs> okay, so, so um, I'm floating up in space, and so I'm looking up at the stars, and I realize that, you know, stars, galaxies, I can see them all. It was beautiful. And a galaxy, I thought was a galaxy at first, was a collection of stars was spinning. And I hovered closer and closer to it when I suddenly realized there were multiple channels of light moving up from the earth up to where I was. And my bubble was stuck in one of the channels. And these channels were full of people. These were spirits who had died like myself. Wow. Some of them spoke, I could hear them. Some of them spoke languages I didn't understand. And we all were taken up to the, uh, to the opening of a tunnel that was like a whirlpool. It spun very slowly on the outside. But as we got further inside, the circle tightened and tightened and tightened and spun faster. So by the time I got to the end of the tunnel, it was a rather bumpy ride. But um, I remember all kinds of colors flashing and beautiful things lights and colors you know as I went through when I came to the end of the tunnel yeah when I came to the end of the tunnel uh, my bubble floated free and I came to a barrier that looked like uh, a bank of clouds just like I've heard many people say uh, the barrier to heaven is a cloud so I came up to a cloud and my bubble stopped and I sat there for a minute and I thought well what am I going to do here all of a sudden, an arm reached through the cloud, grabbed me by the shoulder, and yanked me up. And then there wasn't really a hard surface, but we were standing there, me and a man. Um, and I didn't know who it was. He didn't know who I was. And we talked a little bit. And he said, well, there's other people just up here that I know that would love to meet you. So why don't we go up there and talk to them? So... They, they were all, see, I was only eight, so I described them as older, but, you know, they probably were in their 30s, maybe their early 40s. So we started talking, and so they couldn't figure out who I was. Somehow I found my voice, and I said, I am Kenneth Lett. And they said, Lett, Lett. They knew that name. Oh, how so interesting. They said, yeah, so they said, who's your father? And I said, Lyle. And then two of the women go, oh, 
we're his grandmothers. Oh. Yeah, so they were um they were my living grandmother's parents and my living grandfather's parents. Wow. I, that's amazing because so many people see people that they know and you know in the afterlife I saw my grandfather but he looked younger so I didn't immediately recognize him and he was the only one who was dead but you didn't have many people on that other side who you would know personally so it was just ancestors how cool right. I had no concept of my grandparents having parents it just had never been discussed right I knew my grandma I knew my grandma and grandpa were alive and that's all I really knew my dad had never talked about his grandparents. So <clears throat> after the concept of my grandparents having parents and they had passed on and that's who they were, it, it just hit me and I understood suddenly. Then I was swarmed by people that were related to my family that wanted to come say hello. Um, I even met a couple of my father's school teachers. Oh. And they just sort of bought they just sort of bopped in and said, oh, well, I taught your, your dad in high school, and he was a very good student, you know, that kind of conversation. How beautiful. They, yeah, yeah, and then they it, say, well, nice, nice. Go ahead. Sometimes teachers do have, like, a role in our development, kind of like parents. I certainly had a profound change from my English teacher who recently passed on, and I felt her in spirit a few times. You know, she's just kind of happy when I'm happy or moving along my path, so that's beautiful that that they were there to greet you as well interesting so i have to ask you just real quick just i know i'm telling my story but do you do you often feel that uh, your communication is open to heaven all the time like every so often you receive messages from people up there to confirm your love or to give you encouragement, do you feel that? I do, I do. Like when things are going well or when they're especially difficult, um, you know, I, I, it seems like they clue in to, oh, she's in a happy phase, like good for her, yay. <laughs> or, oh, I know it's trying, you can keep going, do it. <laughs> so I do get that encouragement and support, it's interesting. So I'm talking about this when I'm a kid and I've, the operation's over, I'm living, and I'm back on earth. And I'm talking about this connection to heaven, and everybody thought I was crazy. Aww. Well, thank you for confirming that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, so you're back up in heaven with your ancestors, and what do they say to you? What what happens? Well, uh, we mostly, we mostly just talked back and forth and got familiar with each other. Um, but um, how can I put it? I saw... My grandfathers, my great-great-grandfathers sort of sat back a little bit. They weren't so much up front. It was my great-great-grandmothers who, uh, who did most of the talking. Then I was introduced to my great-great-grandfathers. Then one of them was when I first saw him, and that was Grandpa Kristen. He was sitting in a high back chair just like this. Hmm. And so he got up and he said, would you like to sit in my chair? So I did. But um, I didn't think anything of it at the time. So then eventually one of my grandmothers came to me and said, someone very special is coming for you. And this is very important that this happens. But don't be scared. Don't be frightened. Um, this person might, might uh, want to take you. And just go cooperate. And just go ahead with it. So I was, okay, fine. <laughs> I, was, I was surrounded by all this love and acceptance. And it was, it was wonderful. So... This woman shows up, and maybe I should call her an entity um, as opposed to a woman, but she had the appearance of a woman. Her hair was chopped very uneven and short, and it just looked like somebody had given her a terrible haircut. And so that was one of the first things I noticed about her, and I, um, I asked her about it. And, but just out of curiosity as a child, and she said, well... When I lived on Earth, we cut our hair with knives. Not we, we didn't have any scissors. And I was like, oh, okay. And then an image of scissors came to me. And so I go, yes, scissors. And she said, no, we didn't have those. Um, I just had a knife. So that's why my hair looks this way. And I was fine with it. And th that woman had so much love in her that I believe... 
she was she treated me like a mother so that's just how I think of her as mother and she said would you like to go with me I have some very important things to show you and of course I said yes so as we were moving along it was just her and I she held me like a baby at one time or she was like walking me like as a little boy um, holding my hand and all the time just giving me all kinds of love and acceptance which was wonderful so she said first of all I need to tell you that your family has a very long history so I'm going to demonstrate that she walked up to a place and she waved her hand and a, another tunnel opened up like a hole I describe it sort of as a cave and I could see going back in this tunnel that there were people and it was like the further back they got they were older generations uh, of the Lett family. And so she said, see here, see here, this is your family. See how far back it goes? And it did, it went very far back. Like I would say I could, I could visually see at least 10 generations. Um, some, some of them were sitting in chairs with each other. Um, I saw one of them was sweeping the stairs um, at the back door of her house. Um, and I'm not real sure who she was. Anyway, um, at the far end of this tunnel, I saw a brilliant bright light. And so this, this entity that brought me here, um, so from now on, if you don't mind, I'll just refer to her as mother. Um, so mother said, look here, the light's coming to see you. It's coming to greet you. And so pretty soon it was in front of me and then it looked like a man. And, um, so I asked her, who is this? And she said, well, on earth, they might have called him Jesus. So she said, this is my son. So the mother I met, I believe, was Mother Mary. And she introduced me to Jesus. I don't remember him speaking too much, um, but I remember the, the, them communicating back and forth with much love and respect for each other. Did you get something about his presence too, the way that you got something about the angels? I mean, did you have intuitive impressions? You know, I can't describe his face. I think it's because he enveloped me in his light. Um, it was so intense. Um, all I remember him, I can't say that he looks in the face anything like pictures of Jesus that I've seen. I can't say that. Um, but because of him, um, he brought his power to me, I guess is the way to put it. Um, and he triggered my, uh, life review. Hmm. But, um, before the life review took place, um, he completely enveloped me in the life and in the, in the light. And I sort of like merged with it. I, I could feel the light penetrating me down to. I guess you could say, if it's possible, down to every cell of my body, if you can picture what that's like. Oh, I can. Did you I, feel expanded in a way, you know, not only filled with this yeah. light, but kind of like beyond your aura, like your, you know, your, your aura had expanded in a sense? Yes. And a recent memory that's come back to me is I heard a deep rumbling voice, and I remember the words Alpha and Omega. Hmm. And... That, felt, that voice told me other things, but I can't recall them. I, had, I, do, I, do remember, I do remember Alpha and Omega, though. I do remember the deep rumbling. You know, like, it's hard to describe. How do you describe something so powerful, a voice that kind of rings from within you, but you hear it from the outside as well? It's, it's undeniable. And it seems as if certain yeah. statements want to be communicated and remembered, and it, vibrationally maybe they're stored in some way so I look at it like some are are not quite as strong the signals and others are vibrationally so strong and profound you could never forget them you know like for me it was be like a little child remind them to go to nature love is all that matters those little statements were huge statements that rang really deeply within me but there were other statements so maybe that's does that make sense to you absolutely I have no question about that. It's that's what I felt. Hmm. So right right after I was in the light, then I remember my life review taking place. 
And it was almost like watching a movie. So um, if I saw something that kind of got my attention, I would sort of point to it or call out, and th then mother would stop it, and then we would look at it more closely. So I remember seeing my birth, and I remember being a little bit confused because the doctor was spanking me so hard. But I know now it was because I wouldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. And he was afraid, he was afraid that I had been um, brain damaged because of the overdose of uh, laughing gas. But I cried, I took my breath, and then he was happy. But my mother also told me uh, on, on her dearth, um, deathbed, she told me that uh, she was warned I might be retarded, that I would be mentally off when I was born. So um, she always kind of protected me. I'm talking about my mother on earth, by right. the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I tend to skip around and I don't oh, want to no. confuse people. No, that's all right. Um, so the life review, you saw your birth and I was really curious about this. Uh, so was there lessons that you had to learn even as an eight year old or do you feel like it was more um, just kind of comprehensive? It was, it was comprehensive. Uh, Mother in Heaven didn't explain anything about it to me. I just, I just recall looking at it and being a little bit confused or, or concerned perhaps that the doctor would be so rough with a newborn baby. Um, and that's all I re really recall. Um, and then I, I, I was shown several segments of my life up until that point. And most of it was spent with family because my mother had, came from a very large family, uh, 11 kids. And she was, she was one of the oldest. So I had aunts and uncles that helped take care of me at times. They played with me because they were still children. Mm -hmm. So actually I have an aunt that's only about, I think she's only four years older than I am. So, um, so we saw a lot of those segments. But my favorite segment, we were sitting around the kitchen table of my parents' home. My mother's parents were there, and I remember telling Mother in Heaven, that's my grandma and grandpa, Stephen Bass. And uh, so we stopped and we looked at that. And it was a time when I was a toddler, and I was in my mother's, in the safety of my mother's arms at the kitchen table. She was holding me. Grandpa Steve started playing with me. And um, so he would make silly faces. So I would reach out my hand and I would get close to his mouth and he would playfully act like he was gonna chew on my fingers. He would go Wah! like he was gonna chew on my fingers. And I would squeal and laugh and I'd pull my arm back and I would cuddle with my mother. And I remember mother in heaven loved it. She was delighted. She was like laughing too. And everyone sitting around the table was laughing. And then Grandpa Steve would ignore me, and I reached out my arm a second time, and I get closer and closer, it got close to his mouth, and rah, and he would turn and he would nibble on my fingers and act like he was eating them, and oh, and I would squeal, and everybody was having so much fun. I remember Mother in Heaven, heaven telling me, "This is important. This is love. This is what life is about." Oh, and that kind of brings tears to my eyes. You know, it's those simple moments where we're playful and loving with one another that matter. Hmm. I came from a family that there were so many, my grandfather had so many grandchildren. He played with them all and he played with them like he played with me. And it was, he sort of brought them into the family that way. It was like a baby initiation, uh, <laughs> a welcome to the family. Grandpa had to play with them. So How he was really, a, yeah, he was really a neat guy. So um, where would you like to go from here? Because um, well, yeah. there's more. Yeah, so there's more to the near-death experience. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. I, I was, <laughs> so after, I was the, shown, after the life review, what happened? Well, mother took me to other places and, and sort of... Uh, uh, gave me a tour of heaven. So at some point, I remember being taken to like another barrier, and they said, "It's okay, you can go through here, and you can you can experience this." And when I went through this other barrier, it was like the entire universe opened up to me, and it was full of knowledge. And I remember sort of flying through it, almost like I was 
orbiting a planet. It was just, I was slowly floating through it, taking in all this information. And I remember thinking to myself, this all makes so much sense. Everything fits. It's wonderful. All this knowledge. So do you I remember do you believe, I hear this sometimes, that the universe is conspiring to help us in so many ways? Do you feel like all of that knowledge was there to help humanity in some way? Do you feel that, you know, if everyone understood more of it, the world would be a better place? Is that the kind of sense? What kind of sense did you get as you flew through it? Well, very good point. I believe mankind and our spirits, when we die, we contribute to that knowledge. Hmm. It's not a one-way street with God. We give and take. And I believe when we die and pass on and we go through our near um, our life reviews, that God takes some of that from us and adds it to the power of love that establishes heaven. So that so, all can be healed in heaven? Is that... Yeah. I believe God takes... I believe that God takes the best of human discovery and uses it. Um, however, at the same time, God knows the future. So he's in complete control. And I say he because the voice is deep and rumbling like a man. Right. Right. So this but, sphere of knowledge that you were flying over and you got a sense of, um, what came after that? Well, mother took me other places. Um, at one point, I was, I, I've been told by other near-death experienced people that perhaps what I saw was the book of, of human history or a book of knowledge. But for years, I, I believed that what I had seen was an image of the Bible. So I saw, anyway, I saw this large book and I saw pages flipping and a voice was telling me, this entry is incorrect. Humanity doesn't understand. Uh, they recorded this story incorrectly. This story is accurate. And, I, it, and it was like I was being shown the Bible. But I've had some others tell me that it might have been the book of human history. I don't really know. So, you know, there's the Gnostic Bible as well as the Bible. There's a lot of people who believe, you know, a lot has been written out. Do you think that that could be part of it? I, I do. Yeah. Um, I believe Christianity hijacked religion somewhat uh, true faith and religion I believe that the Gnostics followed was to recognize that we are spirits and that we exist solely because of God and that we have God within each every single one of us and that seems whereas church go ahead oh no no that seems to be the lesson of so many near-death experiences is we're so loved and we are this part of God and it's just so you know, the worst and the best of us and all, you know, like there is this light within us and that is, yeah, that's a common thread, but yes. Common thread. Whereas many churches, what I've detected is, well, I'm not going to name a specific religion, but uh, in some religions, I believe they te teach their people that, um, how, can, how can I say it, that we don't deserve God's love. We must work for it. That uh, we must always demonstrate humility. And if God um, believes we've done good enough, then we can receive his love. Which really but sets I've, people up to judge other people. Like I'm doing good and you're not <laughs> instead of reaching out in love. And that's been part of my biggest message and mission is like, hey, when someone, when a young child is acting out in a public school, look behind the scenes to what's going on. Why are they acting out? Don't immediately judge anyone and look to how love can heal them. You know, like that seems to be more in line with God and more in line with the near-death experience to me. But yeah, that, that anything that sets people up to judge one another is probably not on the path of light. <laughs> So that's where I believe religion or Christianity hijacked true faith and interfered with our relationship with God. So humanity has been sort of struggling ever since. So, okay, so I saw this book and in in the Bible thing was explained to me. 
then eventually I was taken to a place. Um, mother took me to a place uh, that she said, I have another thing to show you. And it, it feels like I went to a room, but it was big. And what I saw there was a model of the earth sitting up on a pedestal. And I could see it. It was very intricate. And it was revolving very slowly, just like the earth would. I saw specks of light all over the earth. And it was explained to me that those specks of light are human souls. And when a human soul would die, I saw a streak of light living, leaving the earth and going up into the heavens, just like I had. So I would, it was explained to me that when a soul dies, they take, they, they take their journey to reach heaven. And I saw them leaving the earth. So I was fascinated by this thing because I've always been sort of mechanically inclined, you know. So um, I, I asked a lot of questions and I was told with this, with this model or with this thing, this machine, we, re we record all of the past history, but we also can tell you what the future will be. So I wanted a demonstration of the past. I was, please, please, please show me something in the past. So yeah, it was almost like I was in a video all of a sudden, and I had the sensation of flying like I was a bird. And I was hovering around a very large city that I believe could be described as ancient Rome. I remember a lot of stone structures, a lot of people in very narrow streets, and there was a parade or procession going through the streets, and there was a lot of happiness. And I looked at all this, and I was like, well, you know, this is interesting, but I can't really relate to it. And my next question was, can you show me where I came from? Can you show me my point in time on Earth? And I was told yes. So they pointed down to the United States. You couldn't, it wasn't like a map. You couldn't see the lines of the states or anything. But uh, they pointed down to uh, the earth and they pointed about to where I was born and where I was living. And all of a sudden a vision opened up in front of me and I could see the future. So um, they said, okay, this, uh, if you return to earth, this is the next, this is the, this is one of the first things you're going to witness. This is what you will see. And some people are going to not believe this, but it's true. I swear it's true. I saw the first thing I saw was the assassination of JFK. Oh, interesting. And, very yeah, important. and that was a powerful me, moment in time. I mean, that's one of those moments in time where people start trying to reverse engineer what happened, why did it happen, what was the call, you know, what are all the forces that caused this moment? So did you see it just as an event? I didn't see the blood and the gore. All I knew was there was a, a procession of cars um, driving, suddenly leaving a place very fast. And I knew it was the president. And I knew that he'd been hurt. That's all I knew. And I remember asking, why, if God knows that this is going to happen in the future, and to me, this is a terrible thing, why would God let this happen? Why would he allow my president to be hurt? Because um, even though I was eight, I understood that there was a lot of love for JFK and my family. They really appreciated him, and I knew it. So I was upset that he was hurt, and I asked why God would let that happen. Um, and it was very simply, just point blank explained to me, history needs to play out. These things that you're going to witness here, they're going to happen whether you like it or not. Um, and we can't interfere. We have to let it go. There's a bigger reason why this is going to happen, and maybe you'll understand if you keep watching. So I said, okay. Um, they continued to show me things. So I saw all the disruption of the riots that took place in the 60s afterwards. I didn't understand why it was taking place, but I saw it. Um, I saw wars come and go. They all happened. I saw that. I saw a little bit of the Vietnam War. And I just have to stop uh, because your near-death experience is so different from my own and from some that I've heard, except for Howard Storms. His was intricate and you know had a lot of detail about the past and the future and 
you know, a lot of questions were answered in that near-death experience. So this is really, yours is unusual, you know, for the detail about the future and the detail about these things that, um, so how much detail, if you had to just estimate, because we may not be, have, we may not have time to cover it all, like how much of the future do you think you were shown? Um, well, let's, let's put it this way. It got really intense at about the time I saw, I believe President Trump will be impeached. And about the time that happens, our country is going to go through a terrible disruption. And um, to kind of take this full circle, after I had viewed the future, mother took me aside and there were, we had a conversation about me returning to earth and what would my life be like? And she said, I need to protect you because I don't want you to become a prophet. If you become a prophet when you're a child, your life is gonna be really difficult. And she said, so I'm going to erase some of your memories. And she did, she sort of reached into what I had viewed. I don't know how I can call it a memory, but she reached in and she sort of smoothed all that out. And she said, this will protect you when you're younger, when you return back to earth. But when you're older, all this will come back to you. And it has. At what point did it start coming back to you? I mean, did you, I'm sure you felt different as a kid after that near death experience, but when did some of the, I guess the future events start coming to you as they happened or ahead of time? I was about it. It's, I, I didn't remember much of the future until I had a very intense dream and I was, I was in my early twenties and I was living in Denver and I had a very intense dream and, and God, his voice woke me up. So in, in my dream, I dreamt that I was in my, uh, my small ho hometown church, excuse me, that I was naked and I was hiding behind the pews in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't feel like I could approach God. He was up on the altar, and there was a bubbling stream. There was grass. There was flowers. There were birds. It was beautiful. And he, he called out to me in that rumbling voice, Kenneth, Peter, let, will you approach me? And I sort of peeked up behind the pews, and I said, no, I don't think I'm ready. And immediately the dream ended. And... The months, the weeks, the years following that, my memories of the future all came back to me. So the first time I wrote my near-death account took place, I think I was about 24 or 25. I took some writing classes in a, a community college, and that's when I started writing everything down. It's just sort of as a personal exercise. So that's when the memories that mother took away from me came back. So it was triggered by God. Interesting. And I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, probably viewers are going to be angry with me if I don't, you know, ask some specific questions about the future. So do you think that there's anything we can do as a collective, though, if you say, you know, a lot of people do fear chaos in the United States, that's something in Howard Storm's um, book, and that's something that I think collectively people fear. I always put forward this idea that there's always hope if we focus more on community instead of competition, if we focus on love for one another instead of um, fear. Do you see like some hope for this country and other countries if we change our focus? I, I believe the future can be changed, but I was shown that after the chaos, that um, well, I, don't, I really don't want to scare people because what I saw was very destructive. Um, may, I need to tell the truth though, so I hope it's okay. It is, yes. Um, I saw eventually after Donald Trump is, is, um, is impeached, um, the, the country is split, divided and between east and west and eventually an army from the west will approach the east and there will be a terrible war 
But on the good side, what I was shown was when the war is over, um, the uh, United States will sort of be cleaned and um, that um, we'll, we'll be back on the right track. But then even beyond that though, I saw a terrible explosion happen that wipes out most of life on the North American continent. That's including Canada, United States. It was a terrible explosion. It was like a ring of white in the center. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe it wasn't the caldera in the Yellowstone that exploded. And then a white ring just went completely across the nation from side to, you know, from east to west. Wipes out most of life. But then I was shown the future beyond that, people living very humble and happy lives. And, be, and I remember being told, so you see, Ken, in the future, everything will get better and humanity will be back on track. And that all the mistakes that have been made in the past, those will be wiped clean. And then everything will be good again. So there is, there is something to look forward to, but Unfortunately, to be to answer your question directly, um, can we avoid the chaos? Can we avoid the, the war? I wasn't shown that option. I was shown it's going to take place because it must. I guess. I also was shown. Go ahead. I guess my hope is always that you know within individual communities and times, even like during the Great Depression, there are people who become millionaires. Even during times of war, there are people who. Um, you know, remain in peace. And I guess my hope is that every community within a possibility, you know, within a possible range can center love for one another and create pockets of love, even during destructive times, no matter how destructive or not destructive the times are. So that's a hope. <laughs> well, and I can confirm that. Yes, I can confirm that. And I, I did see people doing very good things for each other during the chaos helping each other, uh, protecting each other, those types of things. I did see that. Um, so just to sort of summarize what, what I saw, it was all based on what my personal future would be. This is what I, I was told, this is what you will witness if you go back to earth. And what was your And role? I don't believe if there is, excuse me? Oh, and what was your role? What were you shown as your role in all of it? Um, well, I'm living in Nebraska now, and I believe that's where I'm supposed to be. Um, I will probably support and help the Army from the West because they will be the ones that win. Uh, I was shown that the final battle will take place someplace around Georgia, Atlanta, and when it's over, people will be shaking their heads and wondering, why did we fight? Why did we do this? Why did we believe so many wrong things? But um, yeah, it, it, it upsets me too. <laughs> I don't want it to happen. If I could stop it, I would. But at the same time, mother told me that um, nobody's gonna change their behaviors by anything you say. Um, I was told that my personal influence in the world is not going to change anything. I can talk about it, but it's going to happen in spite of me. So, and what is in it? a way, I'm a bit... What is it you think well, in that... In a way, I'm a bit... Oh, what is it you think that people will realize they didn't understand? Like, the lies that they believed or the experiences that they believed instead of the truth? What do you think that they will come to recognition and go, oh, okay. I was, that, thank you. That's a very big point. When I was, when I was shown the image of the Bible, I was shown the history of man, mankind through it. I saw the formation of churches in Europe and those old ideals coming to America. And I was shown that the, uh, I guess they're referred to as the evangelistic churches of America, would be a very big part of the problems that are, America is suffering. I saw them rise in political power. I saw them begging uh, for money from the old and the feeble, people who can't afford to give them money. I saw them build 
great mansions, great buildings, wonderful complexes. But I was told, don't worship God and that they're evil and that they will have a major influence on the outcome of the strife and the chaos in America. And it's happening right now today. Um, they're, they're in the Oval Office with our president laying hands on him. And they fly on their private jets back to their mansions. And that's not what a religious figure, that's not the kind of life that a religious figure is supposed to live. They're not supposed to be involved in politics. They are not supposed to be wealthy. And they're not supposed to try to enact legislation that controls our lives. Those three things alone are considered terrible sins. So from time to time when I've been in Facebook in these near-death groups, I have openly said, if politics are being preached to you from the pulpit, leave that church. Oh yes, I, I have always, since intuitively as a child, I have disliked, I grew up in East Texas where you know that evangelical movement is very strong. I couldn't believe that someone in a church was telling me how to vote when as a kid, I had this intuitive feeling whose eyes were kind, whose voices were telling the truth. And I was like, that knowledge within me is stronger than whatever it is that person is saying. And I will listen to that intuition within me just of basic kindness and goodness, you know, that that's what I will be drawn to in this world. So I, I do understand what you're saying. And, and, you know, this is, I'm glad you're bringing it up because near death experiencers get attacked by evangelicals a lot because their near death experiences don't resemble the Bible specifically. And I knew that that was coming and I saw it happen to even Alexander and Anita Morjani and so many of them. So when I began writing my book, I looked at my whole life and I realized that some of the greatest harm and the greatest sins that were done against me as a child were done by evangelicals. And, you know, that they hid behind the word of God and their piousness, but they were often child abusers or, you know, they were not necessarily, you know, good loving people. That love was not what was being centered. And so from the beginning, I was like, well, I'm, I don't care if I piss them off. In fact, you know, let's go ahead and dig in and really talk about this on, on some level. So there was this, um, you know, no matter what religion anyone is, if they are coming from a place of love, and I'm sure even some people at an evangelical church can center love and compassion and great beauty for others, but there is this kind of movement undercurrent of judgment and hate that seems very strong in many of these churches and I'm not at home in these places. And so, yeah, I understand. So, and so their, their political activities, uh, legislation, okay. The anti-gay thing, sorry, but that's God's child. And gay people have existed since the beginning of time, since before we probably learned how to read and write. I mean, humanity, uh, so who are they now in the United States to declare that we must punish them in the name of God? We must pass legislation that makes their lives more difficult. Who are those people that believe that and why? And then you talk about abortion. The question I want to ask the people who were so adamant about abortion being such a terrible thing in the eyes of God is, how are you so certain that God wants you to pass legislation that bans abortion? How do you know that? How do you know that law will please God and that you're doing God's work? Who told you that? I, they can't answer it. I believe it's just an issue that was brought up by the evangelicals to gather more votes, to get people feeling guilty and to vote a certain way. Yeah, there's a and, um, friend of mine who uh, she made a quick little video about how I think there was legislation about how women should get the death penalty who have abortions. And she was like, wow, we women must really be making strides if they want to kill us now. <laughs> and that, that, you know, that's a, a really good point. Um, a lot of people who listen to my interview with Howard Storm, I keep bringing him up because a lot of things you're saying remind me of him. He said that he saw aborted souls just going right back up to heaven as if they were recycled 
And as I've talked with more and more people, sometimes people know the miscarried children or the aborted children that they, you know, in, in the spirit world have communicated with them or had some kind of relationship or healing with them. Um, and that sometimes they go on, sometimes they stay near that person because they just love them, you know, and just wanted to be on an energetic part of that journey with them. So there's all kind of possibilities that maybe this black and white thinking doesn't cover. And it's, it's interesting, you know, on that subject. I don't want to get too far off down this, this road because I, I am going to get attacked, I'm pretty sure, in the comments section for this video. Um, well, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's gonna happen. That's fine. Um, what and this is maybe where we'll start winding down. But what do you think is the purpose of this pre-birth memory and this near-death experience? Like the after effects and the effect on your life. What have you found to be the most profound or the most beautiful or the most helpful of having these experiences at such a young age? Well, I have to tell you that um, living in a state that doesn't have a lot of population, um, ne Nebraska's not very populated. Um, I was isolated and did not know another near-death experienced person until last summer. I, I finally decided this has been a part of my life long enough that I signed up for an IONS conference, and it was in Denver last summer. And since I was familiar with Denver and that's where my daughter lives, I decided to go to the conference. And it was wonderful. I could feel the uplifting power of a building filled with people like us, you and me. I could feel the positive energy in that hotel. And it was wonderful. It was like breathing fresh air. I was surrounded by people that knew how to love. Um, something I hadn't witnessed before. So I was 62 last summer, and that was the first time I actually got to sit and speak with another near-death experienced person. I've wow. been on my own up until just last summer. Wow. Now was... it's just like, now it's just like I want to talk to all of them. I want to be with them. I want to be around them. So I've learned that I do have some healing powers. I can help people. I know that. I know the power of touch helps people. Um, I just don't quite know how to use it. I haven't developed it very well yet. Um, I know that um, I, can, I can open up and I can visualize my experience within the white light and I can communicate with God anytime I want to if I just have a quiet moment and I can think and meditate. And there's a lot of positive energy up there that's available to any one of us if we just know how to use it and how to tap into it. Yes, yeah, so you know, that heaven on earth is a feeling that we can bring down here, even to the worst of situations, that we can overlay that love. And that's something that I've been feeling lately. But I was at that conference. I didn't see you there <laughs> that, that, that I remember. But yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, went to the, I went to the Experiencers Lounge. Oh. Oh, yeah, I didn't go to that, but I spoke on Thursday and then I was at a lot of the big talks and many of the smaller talks um, listening. But yeah, yeah, it was great. That was my first conference on a national level, too. Well, OK, perfect. Well, I showed up Thursday night. I signed up for the three day. So I showed up Thursday night and then uh, Friday was my first. And then I met Ellen Dye, you know her. Uh, oh, Peter Pent. How do you say it? Pandor? Pandor. Yeah, yeah. I interviewed yeah. him. He's my second interview. Yeah. <laughs> he was sitting alone in the experiencer's lounge, and I walked in, and he was meditating. And I walked in and sat like two chairs away from him, and it was just being quiet. And he sort of woke up and looked at me, and he goes, oh, hello. And uh, I said, I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to stop your meditating. Go ahead if you want to. And he goes, no, 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 that's fine. And so we talked a little bit. He gave me some advice, and um, so I really like him. Yeah. So he's a good guy. There's so many beautiful people at that event, like you said, and the energy is ecstatic and joyful and, and open, and I really do wish that the world could be more like that, <laughs> you know, that when there are a lot of experiencers who are bringing that 
that knowledge of the other side into interactions here on the planet. It is just, it's beautiful. And I'm so glad you got that experience. Um, so too. <laughs> how did you process it in the rest of your life? Uh, all those many years before, did, was it difficult at times or? Very difficult. Um, my mother communicated to me that um, she noticed right away my personality had changed after my near death in 1963. Um, I became even more sensitive. Um, I no longer wanted to compete for fun with my friends. Hmm. Uh, competition wasn't fun for me, so I had no interest in sports. So, um, yeah, it, w it was difficult, but I learned, I learned to adapt. Um, I had some trouble with a few teachers because they accused me of constantly um, uh, daydreaming. And actually what I was doing was I was processing information as I heard it during the lessons. It appeared to them I was daydreaming, but I wasn't. I was just processing in my own way. Um, they thought I had a reading disability, but I didn't. Um, but it was a way to get out of the classroom, so I got to go to a special session with a special education teacher. <laughs> um, I've always loved to read. And I read a lot of books uh, when I was younger, probably books that were not meant for a person my age. Um, so I, I didn't really, I didn't really talk about my near death, or it hadn't didn't really come to the forefront until uh, God came to me in that dream. In your twenties, yeah. And in yeah. my early twenties. Interesting. Yeah. Then it just all came to me. If there's one thing that you want to leave people with from your experience, so you had a really profound one to have these pre-birth memories and to see so much of the workings of heaven. What do you think that people who are struggling, so struggling financially, struggling emotionally, struggling in all these different ways, what piece of advice from heaven would you give anyone who's struggling? Well, uh, first of all, I, I would hate to leave this session um, with the notion that um, something positive cannot be done to prevent chaos in the, in the United States. Actually, I believe something can be done, and it takes people like you and I to keep communicating and keep educating, to keep telling people that there's better ways. Um, living, living the rat race and focusing only on making money and acquiring material things is not the way to live your life. So learn to connect with nature, learn to meditate, learn to open up yourself to the possibility that you don't have to go through a church to get to heaven. If you learn to meditate, learn to love yourself, learn to forgive yourself, and truly treat others as you wish they would treat you, uh, things will be better. And maybe we could put a dent in some of that chaos. It doesn't have to happen. I, th I feel that's very important. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you said that. That I think with the great hope is that the spread of information and communication on this level can enlighten people, can just reach into their consciousness, and we can learn. I, I want to think of this as a movement, like the Near Death Experience Summit on the June, on June 16th that I put together. Like meditation, when it's done all together, it can raise the vibration of a city. I'm, I'm thinking that creating this summit can help raise the vibration of people who join or just even who have heard of it, you know, like on some level, just the fact that it exists will raise the vibration of this planet. And and that is my great hope with interviewing different people is that we remind others that love is all that matters. So, you know, competition is not necessarily what matters. Love is what matters. And when you're cooperating with someone, often you have a better product in the end because it's for, it's maybe competition to create the best possible thing, you know, that can help the greatest number of people. And you're working together in that way. And it just, it's a different way of, framing the world and looking at the world instead of looking at it as limited resources and, you know, I must have this and you may not have it. And, you know, even in human relationships, I'm sure maybe you've noticed this as well. This is as a near-death experiencer, I don't understand manipulation, yeah. 
I don't understand, you know, when people compete with one another for someone else, or they try to control someone in a romantic relationship. I'm like, wow, love is all that matters. So begin with love for yourself. You know, like, first of all, do that, clear any fears and attachments that you have concerning anything in life. And then reach out in love to others because you're already clear and centered in that love yourself. And I always tell my high school students, like, for goodness sakes, if you can learn one lesson in all your human relationships, that is, don't even bother trying to manipulate others. It's just not even worth, worth your time. You know, you might in the short term be able to, but in the long term, you never will be able to. But that's my little bit of advice. I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Well, yeah, um, the the three things that I keep trying to, excuse me, I keep, I'm sorry, I haven't drank as much water. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> the three things that exist here on earth that do not exist in heaven, um, guilt, shame, and fear. Mm -hmm. Recognize those things to be earthbound. Recognize those things to be human created. God does not send us guilt. Just because we feel it doesn't mean it came from God. It comes from humanity, and it's when humanity manipulates each other, they use those tools to control us. So on a daily basis, tell yourself, I am going to work towards eliminating guilt, shame, and fear, even if it's a small bit. In my day, in my day to day, in my life, I want it gone. And when you realize that guilt, shame, and fear does not have control over you, now you're free to love. Now you're free to appreciate. Now you're allowed to take in a deep breath, give yourself a break. You don't have to hurt yourself anymore with your bad habits. Mm -hmm. You can go out into nature and you can take in the beauty have a deep breath and say, thank you, God. Hmm, wonderful. Oh, well, that's, that's a beautiful <laughs> <I'm sorry>. place. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a beautiful place to end. It really is. And that is, you know, that is what prevents us from getting to love as a lot of feelings like that. And it's, it's very important. Well, I am going to end here, but thank you so much for sharing your journey. And it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. You're, you're a beautiful person. So, um, I mean, your soul is so beautiful. I just love, I love you. I've, I've watched some of your videos and I really enjoyed them. And oh. I'm sorry I missed you at the conference. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> um, but thank you for sharing your story. And for those who are watching, please subscribe and please check out the summit on June 16th. I would love to hear questions from others and to have more people involved and to have you know, future speakers the next year at the summit. But thank you so much. And